Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit Framework demo for February, what are we on, 12? 2019. So quickly I forget. Oh, uh, well. well. Let's talk about some of the highlights from the last couple of weeks here. Uh, we had some uh, kind of uh, a nice assortment of modules come in, including a new module that targets vulnerable web application you might find on some uh, NUO NVR mini devices, uh, which can lead to an unauthenticated uh, remote command execution. Uh, this one came to us from community member Burke DSNR. So uh, very cool there. Uh, and then we had another, another new module targeting uh, events, which is a document viewer uh, that, that was part of the default install for certain Linux distros like Kali uh, 106 and Ubuntu 16.04. Um, and this one came from community member B. Coles. It uses a modified uh, comic book uh, file, which is .cbt, to carry a small payload and can uh, uh, get you uh, remote command execution. Um, word on the street is that recent versions of Atril, which is another document viewer, um, also contain this, still contain the same vulnerability. Um, we'll have a demo, demo of this in a little bit. Uh, we also have a new module for scanning ubiquity devices via their discovery service uh, from our own rapid sevens lab uh, john hart um, and we'll have a demo of that uh, this shortly as well um, additionally we have a, de a new module for retrieving configuration from vulnerable cisco uh, routers uh, models rv 320 and 326 which were aimed at the small business market um, that comes with, that module comes to us from our very own uh, aaron soto uh, no authentication required on this one either and we'll have a demo of that uh, lastly, in this list, we have a new module for retrieving username and password creds from vulnerable uh, C2S DVR management web applications, um, and that comes to us from community member Hoodie. Uh, as, as we like it, no authentication required there either. Uh, let's talk about improvements. Um, we have quite a bit of improvements. Uh, the many more down at the bottom really does mean many more, so you, you, we have a, our best like wrap up at the end of last week um, up on the blog.rapid7.com site as a full list, uh, definitely check it out. But some of the highlights include, uh, we got new Linux uh, x64, IPv6, uh, bind and reverse uh, shell payloads um, from community member EPI052. Uh, we also uh, got 32-bit iPhone support for the WebKit Trident exploit um, from community member Tim Wright, uh, who also got us uh, the, the next one, which was improved reliability uh, for the Mac OS staged payloads, specifically with loading the second stage and final payloads. Um, uh, and Tim also uh, got us the uh, updated file enumeration in Meterpreter so that it correctly understands 64-bit file sizes, 32-bit UID, GID values, and 64-bit time. Uh, additionally, uh, we got a cool uh, update for, uh, for enhanced library support for evasion modules, uh, which also adds the initial scaffolding for integrating with external tools. Uh, from community member Zero Steiner. And uh, we also gained support for generation of RMLE shared object payloads from community member Bola MN. And lastly, on this, this, this short list here, uh, we had support for multiple debugs, uh, levels of debug output in Metal from our own Brendan Waters. Uh, again, the many more encapsulates quite a few more uh, improvements. Uh, so, you know, go to blog.rapid7.com, find the last wrap up, and check it out. And with that, time for demos. So I'll start my, my console over here. Uh, this console. Um, if I could spell, well, that would be this is a, uh, console. Yeah, it's a it's a new it's a it's, it helps me be more effective by saving two characters, uh, or I just haven't had enough coffee. Probably the latter. Um, so well, it's starting up, I'm going to show on the, I've got an instance of Kali 106 uh, running here on the right. Uh, you can see the it's the issue, it's 106. So it's an older version. Um, and uh, that's, this is going to be the target here on the left. Uh, I'm going to create the payload. That uh, CBT file, the payload size itself has to be pretty small. Um, 256 bytes is the, the limit that can be stored. So we'll just use a, a reverse shell. Uh, in this example, I actually am big in these. Um, <laughs> my, my MacBook could use a little coffee this morning too. Come on there. Um, okay. 
All right, so here we go. So I'm just going to, so like the, the, you know, the Martha Stewart that has things prepared, I'm just going to go back in my history and use the step, step through the commands here. Uh, basically, we're select, we've selected the module that we want to use. We're going to select the payload, just reverse bash. We're going to tell it to come back to this uh, system we're running on, framework on, and uh, we're going to run it. And so now it's created uh, a file that contains our payload. So this, this CBT file here. So we will copy this file over. Now you, you would, you know, deliver this file to your, you know, however you could email it to somebody you were hoping they'd open it on their system or I guess it didn't save my SSH command. Uh, my history here. So I'll just, or SCP, sorry, SCP. Um, in this case, I'm just going to cheat and just directly copy it over um, just to show the, the functionality. Uh, 128.128.3. If we look down here, this is the, the Kali uh, UI. So we're in the home directory here, just nothing in there. We're going to copy this over. And, oh, I look. I may have mistyped the password. Okay, so we should see, and we see that it shows up here. Great, it's there. Okay, so now we will get a, get a listener going so that we can actually handle the sh show when it comes back. Um, I forgot to do something. All right, so. Okay, so in here, the target comes and says, oh, I want to look at <coughs> this latest edition of whatever comic book. We'll call it Target Brent. Target Brent, V Cook comic book. I'm clicking to, there we go. And voila, we can say, who am I? Oh, I'm Rick. All right, so cat, let's see, am I really on the right system? Yep, I'm on Kali. So uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Something else interesting about this, um, this particular exploit is that other file management software such as Nautilus or the Etrel, um, they may actually trigger this payload without user interaction by coming through and say, oh, hey, you've got this file that I kind of recognize. Let me generate a thumbnail preview for you. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Here's the shell. Oop. So uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting um, mechanism as well. I, did, I didn't test that out, but it could happen. So like auto mount via USB or something like that. Exactly, exactly. And then uh, to the point uh, earlier, recent versions of Etro are still vulnerable to this, um, although they don't come installed by default, unlike Ubuntu 18.04.1. If you have a desktop Ubuntu 18.04.1 and you just have to get installed Etro for that, you now have a vulnerable, so you have that vulnerability on your system and it still works um, with a fully patched um, Ubuntu 18.04.1. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. Mr. Brendan Waters. Uh, Tom, did you want to give a quick background on this? Yeah, sure. Um, so the end of January, uh, the labs team was made aware of uh, a Twitter comment by uh, Jim Troutman about seeing some potential denial of service attacks related to a discovery service that Ubiquiti devices have. Uh, it's a UDP service that listens on 10001, and it's supposed to be used uh, by Ubiquiti software to or design, uh, discovery devices that haven't been configured yet. And it provides information like MAC address, IP address, firmware model, things like that. And uh, the labs team took a look at it just to see what the exposure was on the internet. We found there were roughly half a million devices out there with the service exposed. Um, and you can get some 20X or better uh, DDoS amplification. And so as mentioned earlier, John Hart on the labs team created a Metasploit module uh, for performing discovery for the version of the the V1 of the protocol. Cool. All right. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, forgive me. There's a squirrel outside. I'm trying to manage some hunters. Um, so as you can see here, I've got, already got the uh, scanner module set up. Uh, and the great thing about this is I had, I had a couple of uh, devices sitting around that weren't uh, being used, so I went ahead and reset them so that they weren't in managed mode anymore. 
uh, fire this off and you can see immediately we start getting results back. In this particular case, you can see we have a, uh, an access point for AC Pro. Uh, this is a camera that came back. I thought we'd get one more come back. No? Interesting. There we go. And here's an MFI uh, power supply or power strip that came back. <laughs> Neat. Yes, the power strip has a uh, has a has a MAC address. The future is now. <laughs> <laughs> what a so, time to be alive! So, if you find one of these devices that are in this mode, does that basically imply that you can also now configure them with default credentials and whatnot? Not always. Um, there's um, there are various pieces of management software mm -hmm. that uh, can be used to manage different pieces of gear. And uh, for example, I have a piece of gear at that is completely configured, has no default credentials and everything, but is not being managed by the software and every time it will respond to okay. discovery packs. So it's sort of a, this thing is not managed by a central system type mm -hmm. protocol. And I think the centralized systems will disable the protocol, but you can still manually turn it on. Okay. Um, we, there is a version two of the protocol that seems to be almost exclusively so far in testing used by the cloud key, which is a central, which is a device that's used for running their management software. Um, but the counts on those are pretty low, on, on, at least on the public internet. There's only some, just under 400 devices. Cool. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Brendan, and thanks for the details, Tom. Appreciate it. Neat. All right. Mr. Soto? So, um, a couple, excuse me, I'll have a Zoom argument. Uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a, um, disclosure on or a posting to the full disclosure mailing list um, that talked about uh, the Cisco RV320. And so we had our hackathon last week and uh, thought we have a day basically to do something cool. And so I thought what better thing to do for the day than to actually uh, give this thing a shot. So basically we spent the day uh, with the morning not having anything like just getting to touch the box for the very first time and by the end of the day, actually having a fully functional working uh, working module. So um, this was a bit of a, a joint effort from the team, but um, I got the, got the pleasure of, of doing most of it uh, and having all the fun. Uh, so the original posting was actually to the, the full disclosure mailing list, and it was from a group in Germany called the Red Team Pen Testing GmbH. I don't know what that means. Um, and basically, they discovered uh, uh, a URL on uh, this little Cisco RV320 that was unauthenticated. And when you go to this URL, you actually get the full config of the device. So they worked with Cisco and responsibly disclosed it. But uh, basically the community started looking at these things. And this is a little small business router. It's got a little four port switch. It's got uh, WAN and USB ports. It can fail over a cellular modem. So it's a pretty capable little box, but not the sort of thing you'd see in like a huge enterprise network, but certainly you know more than capable for, for some smaller, I actually know of a couple businesses that have used these things. So they're, they're definitely common. Um, and so anyway, a lot of the communities started looking at these and we started seeing some more modules for them, but we wanted to jump in and, and get this one out. And, uh, and that's kind of where uh, there were two efforts here. Uh, those of you might have seen, uh, we had a Rapid7 blog post on these where we were uh, looking and, and, uh, across the internet and, and uh, trying to identify these. <coughs> and we're able to do that based off some SS, uh, artifacts in the SSL certificate and actually ended up coming up with uh, over 19,000 devices, uh, which is a pretty significant number, even more so than some of the other uh, research that we were seeing at the time. So long story short, this is a pretty powerful module. Uh, I will also say that it's powerful because uh, you can get to this device from the LAN side, but there's a firmware version that actually is listening on the WAN side as well. So the internet exploitable. Um, so anyway, with that context, uh, we can kind of take a quick look here. Um, I've got uh, uh, Pierce's Martha Stewart method. I just so happened to have <laughs> Pierce, Pierce, uh, yeah. Well, Pierce got the, gave me the inspiration for it and, and Brent got, the, got one of these for us. Yeah, you, do, you, have, you, have, you physically, for those right? that are not in the room, yeah. has, uh, Aaron physically has Isn't one that of these convenient? Right it's been in the room the laptop. whole time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's actually a pretty straightforward module. We can set uh, our, our hosts, as I mentioned, uh, 443 uh, is accessible, but you can also uh, configure this to not use SSL if that was something you wanted to do. And here's the endpoint that we're going to be targeting, uh, this config uh, uh, export 
function. And so literally it's as simple as running it. Uh, the uh, module goes and connects to the device, pulls back our config uh, and stores it in this lovely little file here, which I'll do with another Martha Stewart and there it is. Uh, and so you can see within this, we have uh, certainly credentials that are being stored, but this actually goes on for quite a ways. The entire device configuration is inside of this. So you might find VPN creds, you might find you know, other user accounts, Wi-Fi credentials, cellular modem information, everything. Um, the kind of the, the, the uh, extra uh, side of this as well is that we went ahead and used the uh, database backend to go ahead and extract all that information and put it in so that you can uh, look and see, for instance, our password hash is automatically stored. So it's uh, very easy to dump into future tools. And so there's some opportunities here now that we have this hash to, uh, there's some new attacks that have appeared as well, uh, where we can get uh, some remote code execution on the device and that work is ongoing, but, uh, but the seeds have been planted. Yeah, very nice. Excellent.